find authority. It's great to see so many familiar faces and also some new ones. Um, so we will do a quick round, I think, of introductions because, as I say, there are some new faces today. So if you can just say who you are and where you're from, please. If we start down in the corner with Nigel. Councillor Nigel Lundy from Shropshire. Mm -hmm. Councillor Vina Waters, Morse, Jensen. Councillor Phil Barton, Wolverhampton. Councillor Ian Gett, Old Dudley. Andrew Burrow from Solihull, and an actual fact from the rural bit of Solihull, almost in Kenilworth. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Marshall from Worcester, <laughs> from Redditch, <laughs> which is not rural at all. Councillor Martin yeah. Leppard from Coventry. <laughs> Councillor Cathy Bayerton, Advocate Representative. Lindsay Roberts, Scrutiny Officer for the Combined Authority. Uh, Janice Hicks, Government Services Manager, Combined Authority. I'm Laura Schoff, I'm the Chief Executive of the Combined Authority. Morning, Louise Cowan, Head of Financial Management at the Combined Authority. Morning, I'm Claire Hassel, I'm the Interim Director for Employment Skills and Communities at the Combined Authority. And I'm Amanda Tomlinson, I'm Chief Executive of Black Country Housing Group and I'm Business Representative. Councillor Jamie Tennant from Birmingham City Council. Uh, Councillor Paul Moore, Sunwell Council. Uh, I suppose I count as new, but I did used to be a, a board member of the Combined Authority going back a few years ago, so I'm, I'm probably not new to the Combined Authority. If I think. Good morning, Mark Smith. I'm the Independent Chair of the Audit Risk and Assurance Committee. Good morning, everybody. Judy Cleary, Westminster Five Authority, uh, Governance Services. Right, thank you, everybody, and welcome to today's meeting. Just as a reminder, the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded onto YouTube. Um, and members do need to use their microphones, please, when speaking for, for that clarity. Um, we are Corrit, so that's a really good start to the year. <laughs> so let's hope that continues. <laughs> Um, we'll talk a little bit more as the meeting progresses under a couple of items about the importance of quality um, and, and the need to have uh, a substitute. Now, I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that we the very sad passing of Councillor Brookfield mm -hmm. um, following uh, a battle mm -hmm. of health battle with cancer. So I thought it would be appropriate if we started today's meeting just with a minute silence as a mark of respect for, for Councillor Brookfield. So if we can all stand, please. Thank you, everybody. Right, we'll move on to the agenda. And um, first item is the appointment of the chair, uh, which you can see was made at the CA board on the 9th of June. So you've stuck with me for another year, folks. <laughs> um, so, um, but thanks to the board for supporting that one. We now need to uh, appoint a vice chair. And as in the terms of reference, the vice chair needs to be from the opposing party to the mayor. So it needs to be a Labour member. So um, if I take the nominations for the vice chair, I'd like to nominate Councillor Naeem Maktar from Coventry. Do I have any other nominations for vice chair? Second that. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. So in the absence of any other nominations, thank you very much. And Welcome, Vice Chair. Thank you. Okay, so if we take apologies for absence now, Lindsay. Yes, Chair. Apologies received <coughs> from Councillor Rainbow and Councillor Wood. Thank you. Uh, 
declarations of interest. Everyone have any declarations of interest from members as outlined on the agenda? None? Okay, lovely. And that moves us on to the first item of business, which is a refresh of the terms of reference, which is item agenda item five in the pack. So, Dan, I don't know whether you want to address this item. <coughs> Thank you, Jay. Yeah, it was included uh, in the pack of the recognition. This is the first meeting of the uh, of the new municipal year for for this committee, and, and invariably, therefore, it has new members on, and, and some who perhaps uh, been away for some time. Um, so it's there for for information, principally. Um, you, uh, you can or committee can change its, its term of reference at, at any time during the course of the year and if, if, if you were so minded to do so that would go as a recommendation to the main board who, who uh, uh, have overall uh, oversight and responsibility for the terms of references committees but um, but, but essentially they're uh, they're there to to uh, clarify the, the role of the committee uh, and i think particularly uh, from a member perspective on uh, what would be listed as your page number two, the functions um, which are, are always useful to, to, to bear in mind. Um, so what is uh, what is the, the, the role of the committee? What is it here to do? And, and we've tried to uh, summarise those and capture those in the in the function section. So they're there to note, Chair, unless any member wants to ask any questions or, or any, uh, any, any observations. Um, Thank you. So I'll open it up to the committee if anybody's had got any observations or questions that they want to raise in relation to that item. No, I've not seen anything from anybody. So that, as, as we said, is just an item for noting, but it's just a useful uh, reminder as to the role and the functions of scrutiny. So if we... We've just been joined by Helen Edwards. Yeah, Helen <laughs> is our Director of Law and Governance. Thank you. <laughs> so welcome, Helen, to the meeting. Um, we we'll take the minutes next then, which is agenda item six, for those of you who can cast your minds back that far. Um, I'll take them for accuracy first, and then I'll take them for matters arising. So if I take um, page one for accuracy, Page two, page three, four and five. So we accept that those are an accurate record of, of that meeting. Yeah. OK, thank you. Committee. And I'll then take matters arising. So do I have any matters arising from members of the committee? So matters arising from page one. Matters arising on page two. Now I've got a couple. Um, so the site visit to Green Square Accord um, on 123B, that had to be postponed. But because we've got a number, we've got two, three or four housing papers coming in September on affordable home strategy, we thought it would be sensible if we can arrange um, that visit for members who can make it. Uh, before those papers come so that everybody's got a really good understanding of, of processes, capability and, um, and, and how they can be you know, integrated into our housing strategy. So that's just my update on that. Um, anything else on page two? Any other matters arising from anybody? Page three. No. And page four. I've got a quick question, which I'm not sure whether um, finance or Laura will be able to answer on 127 under the grant register. So I inquired at the time about the social, social housing fund and how that would be devolved. And I think at that time there was dialogue with the, the leaders. Have we got any further on that? No, we haven't. So uh, we can bring an update to the next meeting. Okay. Thank you, just so that we don't lose that point. Um, and anything on page five? No, 
Okay, that's lovely, folks. Thank you very much. That moves us then on to agenda number eight, which is scrutiny within the CA. Um, Dan and Lindsay are going to take this presentation. And again, it's it's an update and it's a bit of a reminder, but also with the new roles and responsibilities coming with the levelling up bill, scrutiny, there's going to be a much greater spotlight on scrutiny going forward. So, Dan, over to you. Thank you, Chair. And, and you, you summarised that introduction nicely. There is uh, this, uh, I've got a short presentation and some slides on the board, on the screen, um, which which is, is um, driven, I think, principally that, that there might be new members to to, to the committee or, or some members who have, who have sat on other combined authority meetings but not scrutiny. Um, cognizant of, of, of course, that, that a lot of members on this committee will, will uh, sit on scrutiny committees in their own authorities. So it's just a, a, a short uh, set of slides which are in your pack but, but on the screen as well and I'll, I'll talk through them about um, overview and scrutiny within a combined authority context perhaps uh, as against from a, a local authority uh, perspective. And then as you've said later on on the agenda um, item number 11 particularly is uh, looking at the scrutiny implications of the DVD evolution deal. So, this is this is more of the general, and then we'll go into the, the, the specifics later on um, on the on the agenda. Um, so the first slide is is uh, uh, an introduction really to overview and scrutiny, and just to 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 uh, make clear to members that overview and scrutiny is a statutory function of the command authority. So this isn't this isn't optional. This is this isn't something we can decide whether we want to do or not. And the the regulations that created the command authority. Um, uh, specified uh, that there must be uh, a, a union scrutiny function. So, so uh, we are here and, and we're here to stay. Um, and and then I've um, kind of summarised, if, if you can, in a sentence, what what uh, what the purpose of scrutiny committee is. And there's, there's two of them, and there's references throughout the, the presentations. So there's your your overview and scrutiny committee, which uh, looks at all combined authority activity excluding transport and then a separate transport delivery anchor scrutiny committee which, which um, looks at the work of, of TFW and the transport boards. And as I've said on the slide, um, members will do that through uh, challenge and oversight of the work of, of the mayor, obviously, uh, the combined authority main board, which is um, our equivalent of, of, of your four councils, which you'll be familiar with, and then the committees as well, of which there's a number of, of thematic committees. Portfolio lead members who are uh, uh, largely the, the leaders of the constituent councils who have a, a thematic lead um, that they're, that they're uh, responsible for, and also officers as well. So there are, there are um, delegated decision making within the combined authority, and it, it's right that uh, as a scrutiny committee, you're aware and, and have oversight of that. And then, um, you know, we talk about overview and scrutiny and, and, and sometimes they get lumped in together. The, the, there is a, um, a, a difference and, and I think it's probably uh, best uh, viewed as, as, as the perspective and the horizon you're looking at. So, so, so overview um, typically gets described as, as looking at the development of policy. So, so this is before um, reports are written or before they're on agendas to go to meetings. So the development of policy, the very early stages of it, and, and how you as members can, can influence that work. Whereas with scrutiny is looking at decisions, as we've said on the screen, is that, that are about to be made or have been made. And so there is, there is um, that immediate pre-decision scrutiny and then the, the, the post-decision scrutiny. So they're just the, the, the two aspects. And it's worth bearing in mind when you're thinking about your, your work programme and, and what you want to look at is, uh, is, is that that um, balance between decisions that have already been taken, so effectively scrutinising the implementation and the effect of them, decisions that are about to be taken, where perhaps your your opportunity to to influence is is, is a little um, less uh, apparent, uh, but also then the, the very early stage scrutiny where uh, where you can quite often have a, a significant amount of impact. And so this one, of course, is, is, is what do we do and how do we do it? And, and that top um, 
top line is is the what do we do and and, and where you will uh, undertake over your scrutiny is is around identifying matters of concern or interest and this is this is your work program this is you know, what what appears on your agendas of, of meetings um clearly members need to be informed of of relevant decisions and and there's um issues around training and, and, and your understanding of the briefing so that you understand um, the issues that you're you're considering and you, and you consider yourselves to be fully informed um, and then shaping those those policy decisions so you, you know stating the obvious but overview and scrutiny committee isn't a, isn't a decision making body you can you, you can help shape those decisions um, and that is 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 your role um, and you do that through making recommendations for actions and change. So, so that's principally with recommendations to the main board or, or a, a thematic committee, if appropriate. But you're you're recommending to to others uh, a course of action that you you think they should take. And then, uh, just um, highlighted uh, below that is a, a little more detail of the way you you will do that. Um, the pre-development scrutiny, so this is the very early stage, as we've said, is, is, is shaping and, and helping to draft um, ideas in their early stage. The pre-decision scrutiny is looking at, at items immediately before they come to a board, and it might be appropriate um, to do one or the other or both, depending on the subject. Um, there's um, what we call deep dives, which which typically happen uh, and the deep dives and topic based reviews which typically happen outside of the meeting. So if you think of your your formal committees like like today the, the deep dives and topic based reviews will will uh, most often occur between meetings where you might have a, a small group of members who will go away and look at a, a particular uh, topic or issue in more detail than, than really sort of time allows in a, in a committee such as uh, such as uh, today um, and then if we just jump to the bottom, because that 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 uh, the implementation, performance, and impact, and monitoring all of that is is a is a really sort of key key role as well. Um, so this is this is the sort of after a decision has been made, but 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 your your responsibilities don't end uh, when a decision has been made, as 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 you have a uh, that that monitoring and, and oversight role. And then just jumping back up to to call in, and I, I did this one last. I think I think call in if you're involved in scrutiny in a local authority will be a, uh, an expression and a, a, a process you'll be familiar with. Uh, so call in as, as as you will be used to it in your own local authority. Combined authority has call in as well. So decisions made by uh, the uh, main WMCA board or any of the thematic committees that you have an opportunity if there is genuine cross party um, uh, interest and concern around a decision then, then as a committee, you can you can call that in, and 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 you'll be uh, familiar. I think you've sat on the committee previously for the what we call the summary of decisions that gets sent out to scrutiny members immediately after each board meeting, which summarises those decisions and then sets out the process to to to, to call in if you, if you want. And just to clarify on that, the two options: if you, if if an item is is called in and and, and appropriately called in, then. Um, there will be a special meeting of this committee where you can you can uh, see the report that went to the original board. You can add offices in. You can have the, the portfolio lead in to 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 question them and and to 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 clarify any concerns that you have. The committee then ultimately have two two options. They can either refer the the, the matter back to uh, the decision making body uh, to their next meeting with a with a report from scrutiny setting out the concerns and asking for the matter to be reconsidered or having had the meeting and, 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 and had issues clarified or the concerns resolved, then you can you can pass it to be implemented. But it, it is there, not 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 to be used frivolously, but it but it is a an important tool um, uh, as part of your as part of your work. Now I uh, talked about um, the fact that a lot of you will be familiar with with scrutiny from a local authority perspective and and there is uh, uh, been quite a lot of work sort of looking at the difference between local authority and combined authority scrutiny um, and we've tried to just capture perhaps a, a, a couple of examples here on this slide as to as to um, what those differences are and I think it's useful when you when you come to to uh, to this meeting to try and kind of switch that thinking if you're if you're involved in scrutiny from your own local authority so 
you know, your own council will be will be very much involved in in delivery, service delivery, um, and um, and and so the scrutiny will will understandably be focused on along that. Uh, combined authority is is categorised as, as being a lot more strategic. So the, the decisions, the policies that that the combined authority make are uh, often related to to longer term change. And so it's it's useful, um, obviously, to 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 think about the different geographical perspective of the combined authority. And it's it's a larger area than your own local authority, but also. That, that we're trying to steer steer the, the, the committee and its, its work into to more strategic rather than um, service delivery. Now, we'll highlighted transport on the slide, obviously that will apply to the transport delivery scrutiny committee, which actually does have oversight more of a of a direct uh, public service delivery. But for this committee, I think I would stress the the, the strategic aspect of it. Um, Second line on that slide is, is around partnership and, and, and certainly from a combined authority perspective, um, so much of what we do is around partnerships and partnership working. And I think that needs to be reflected in, in, in your thinking around scrutiny, whereas a, a local authority may have, have more direct uh, service uh, responsibilities and, and delivering uh, services in itself. Um, so much of, of the combined authorities' work is in partnership with other bodies, and, and that could be local authorities themselves, could be other um, other bodies. And it's it's always useful when you're looking at scrutinies to just think about that partnership um, aspect. Um, and then and then just the at, at the bottom, it's it's around that kind of scope of of the combined authority compared to a local authority. So you will know your your, your own councils have a. Uh, uh, an extremely wide range of services and that it delivers and responsibilities. And then just thinking from a combined authority perspective, how um, firstly each, each combined authority is different in, in, in the powers that it has and the responsibilities, but but how that those responsibilities are driven by um, devolution deals. And, and obviously that's very much in, in, in our, our minds at the moment with the, the deeper devolution deal that um, this committee's done a lot of good work on earlier on in the year. So just how those those devolution deals, those specific powers that that, that the West Midlands Combined Authority has, how you're going to um, think about that in, in in developing your scrutiny work program and 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 how you will, will cover that off. Um, and then characteristics of scrutiny. So, um, as I've said at, at, at the top, it's a fundamental part of governance and decision making and and. and the governments are, are very clear um, in their latest devolution deal with the combined authority that that that, that good scrutiny is absolutely vital in, in the delivery of the devolution deal. Um, and so I, we've identified four characteristics of, 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 of how or what does good scrutiny look like, what 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 should be the approach which we've we've Categorise there. If I go through them as, as as constructive, so the critical friend, we all know that that expression. That's what what you should be uh, thinking of being a, a critical friend to the to the combined authority board. Um, collaboratively, uh, again, so you will need to work with the combined authority, its officers, uh, its members, the mayor, in how you develop uh, those strategies. So so the the, the pre decision scrutiny you're doing is about working with decision makers in order to 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 develop those those uh, strategies of the combined authority evidence-based um that's that's training that's that's understanding that's that's uh, using uh, your your knowledge and experience as local councillors uh, to base your, your your scrutiny work on on, on evidence um, and and using that to 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 help you identify and work you should be uh, looking at and um, because the last one which links into it is is around being productive and, and there's, there's so much that the mind authority does there is there is you know, by definition a finite uh, number of meetings that you have and and, and, and time that you have as, as councillors to to devote to that so I think it's it's really good when when the temptation might be that, that to scrutinize everything it, it, you, know, you, you just won't be able to do that so so I think it's really important that you can, you can focus on where you will have the biggest impact and 
where will where will the workers you as members and the committee have the biggest impact on the wider uh, combined authority decision making and that is uh, I think it's really good to, to, to keep in mind um, and so that leads into to work planning and, and programming and, and you'll see on your agenda there's a work plan that uh, will come to every meeting and, and, and can be adapted and changed as we go through the year because as we said can't can't scrutinize and, and monitor everything so so it is a matter of, of determining what what it is you can look at where you should focus your attention and then so there's just four bullet points there that that, that again is, is worth just asking yourself when you're, you're thinking of, of, of a particular issue um, is uh, to, to, to sort of challenge challenge yourself and challenge the committee as to whether that would be a good use of time so it's about understanding the benefits. What what benefit would scru would be would scrutiny be able to bring to to the issue? What what added value are you are you bringing if you undertake the work? How how could you best do that? And with the next slide, we'll we'll set out some examples. Not always um, at, at, at sitting around a committee with a with an agenda and report. So there's 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 uh, a need to think about how you can best do scrutiny. Um, what would what would the best outcome be what would a good outcome of the work uh, that you're undertaking be? It's, it's, it's this uh, back to this point about how you are are, are productive and, and and add value to to the combined authority, and then the, the theme around again around the, the sort of partnership and, and uh, members who have done have done scrutiny uh, in previous years on this committee, you know, will often involve. Um, other people outside of, of the combined authority, other local authorities, other, other partners. Um, and again, how will you uh, uh, engage with those people uh, when you're when you're undertaking the scrutiny work? So uh, the, the, the final slide and I'll, I'll hand over to, to, to Lindsay, uh, who's our statutory scrutiny officer here at the combined authority, because we're, we're talking about different ways to undertake scrutiny. And, and we could always think of a, a, a committee and a report and an agenda. And, and actually, we're trying to, to, to um, you know, recognise the importance of that, but also to think that there are a number of different ways that you can, you can do scrutiny that isn't just sitting in this room um, uh, considering reports. So if you want to just summarise those things, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Yes, so your work program, as Dan's mentioned, it's a rolling work program, so items can be added throughout the course of the year. And um, there's many different ways that members can undertake scrutiny. You will have your formal committee sessions, um, like today, and you also have informal sessions where the softer scrutiny um, can happen, so where you can have that influence. Um, so you'll have your regular items on the agenda, for example, the <laughs> budget, um, so having an understanding of the funds coming in to the combined authority, uh, and also performance information. Q&A sessions, so Q&A sessions have worked really well for this committee, um, so you've held mayoral Q&A sessions where you can question the mayor. Q&A sessions can also take place with officers and partners. Informal briefing sessions, really good way to have that discussion to help form, inform your lines of inquiry, so to help build your questions. <laughs> Deep dives, again, really good, good way of undertaking scrutiny where you can shine a spotlight on a particular issue. And we've got a report coming later on um, on the agenda on this. The, impact of the education budget was which was a really good deep dive piece of work there speaking to experts again to help inform and ask evidence-based questions use external experts speak to them um most definitely so i would say in summary there's there's many different ways to undertake scrutiny um and scrutiny happens not just in the formal committee it can happen outside of committee as well and um, so, yeah, happy to take any questions. Yeah, that's it. That's, so that was all we were going to say, Chair. Happy again to, to uh, answer any questions today or outside of the meeting if, if members uh, want to chat with you and uh, yourself uh, to talk through some of their, their thinking. But it, as I say, it, it's there just to kind of land some, some thoughts with you and, and hopefully that helps uh, members as they're developing 
they work the program and also undertaking the scrutiny just to kind of recognise it from a from a good mind. So, thanks. thanks both for um, <clears throat> for taking us through those slides. I've just got a, a couple of comments to make before I open up to the rest of the committee. Um, I think one of the things that we do have to think uh, about, and Lindsay and Dan have both alluded to this in terms of scrutiny of officers, but certainly in terms of delegated decision making, you know, where delegated decisions are made by the chief executive and the senior leadership team, how we then as a committee scrutinise them um, on their decision making. So that we will look at that and, and look at how we bring build that in as required through the year. Um, if you look at the forward plan, you will see that we do have several portfolio holders shed, um, intended to come along to various uh, committee meetings to give a direction on papers and give you the opportunity to question them about how the, the decisions, the direction that this particular item is going in. Um, and that's something that we haven't really been particularly good at doing previously so we that's a definite focus for us this year and also you will see on the 4th of september and i think this will help us to focus our direction in terms of work planning will be the annual business plan and we will start to look at the annual business plan on a regular basis um, to monitor progress and delivery um, and that will help inform us because the work plan is a rolling program. It isn't fixed, if you like, so we can add to it and, and change as we go through the year. So I'll hand over to the committee at that point for any questions or observations that you may have. Councillor Tennant. Yeah, um, so uh, you, you've talked about officers and the board and we've got the new Devo deals coming. I believe it hopefully get signed next week. Um, in that, some very significant powers get shifted out the board onto the mayor and secretary of state, looking large about expansion and the role of, and power around the PCC. So I think we need to look about how is this board will be scrutinising the mayor and particularly informal discussions, that very legitimate time informal discussions, but how are we making sure that those discussions do face scrutiny? now that the, the mayor has these these new powers that previously sat with the board so i don't quite have an answer but i think it's something we need to consider yeah thank you and um laura will certainly i don't know whether you want to pick that now laura whether you want to pick it up in your present version no now if that's okay yeah so so just to be clear i think there are two separate things that are happening so one is that we've negotiated a devolution deal uh, which is between ourselves as a combined authority with you as constituent partners and government about, um, well, a huge range of, their, I think there are 52 items on our tracker, whether it's skills or transport or um, environment, and, and we're working through those with government. I think what you're specifically referring to is the leveling up bill that is a government bill that is sat currently, I think in the House of Lords review stage, it is that bill that has provision in it for some of the decisions, which I think we'll come on to later, that bill changes the decision making for some elements of the combined authority to being things that were board decisions to ultimately being decisions between the Secretary of State and the mayor. So that's not our devolution deal. That's that's a bill that's a national bill that has nothing to do with the West Midlands specifically. So the Devo deal, Absolutely. As we start to think about how we're going to implement that and some really big things, challenges this board will want to scrutinize things like single settlement, what that actually means, some of the specific provisions in the bill, both you know, pre scrutiny as Dan was talking about and post will be really helpful. Um, if you'd like to scrutinize the leveling up bill, I don't know how or who you take that up with, but I'm certainly happy to discuss it in this forum. Thank you. Chair. Thanks. Any other questions, Councillor Kettle? Yes, if I may. Uh, all right, the, the, the new deal. Good morning, uh, Laura. Uh, um, the new Devo deal is supposed to be what, 1600 million over four years? 1600, no. Uh, sorry, I don't think we know exactly what it is going to give us over four years. It's 
part of the single settlement will be negotiated. So that will be how how we get a departmental like settlement that um, is how it works if you were a government department. So instead of bidding for individual pots of funding, something I know this committee has talked about the inefficiencies of that before, we would negotiate with um, with government to have a single housing trans a single housing settlement, a single transport settlement, a single skills settlement. So that we're not constantly bidding for bits and pieces, but but today I couldn't tell you what that's going to be worth because we haven't been through those negotiations. But so, there are some headlines of some of like the uh, 400 million of the affordable housing budget, which currently Homes England administer. One of the changes is that we will develop the pipeline with them to make sure that that funding is is targeted at the housing and affordable housing projects that the region really wants to see as opposed to nationally. So some of it's a direct transfer of funding. Some of it is more control over funding that already exists. So it's, it's not quite as simple as one exact number and, and we're still in the process of negotiating it. So uh, and the councils still have to ratify it themselves. So it's not over the line yet. So, so what you're saying is we quite we, we don't quite know how much we're dealing with, let alone when it's going to come and how fast it's going through the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, okay. Another aspect is that uh, transport is often big um, uh, impact on the West Midlands, and um, I recently looked at uh, uh, a scheme that's being worked around Stanbridge and and, and Lye. Um, not a lot of money in real terms, but what was um, obvious to the in the in the, the briefing we're having is the amount of interference the Ministry of Transport has on any any grant that goes out. You give them the grant, but in effect, you're you become an arm of the you know, the Ministry of Transport, and the amount of interference and lack of freedom once you even once you have the money or the go ahead, you can stifle it. And really, the people on the ground who know what needs to be done because of, of the local problems um, get pushed to one side by all this interference from the Ministry of Transport. That seemed quite obvious to me. Um, just a, I'm making a point, you know. So, one of the questions about when's the money coming and, and how much and whatnot can't be asked because. It, it's uh, never coming fast enough and it always has to go out the door faster than we would want to spend it would be my uh, my smug remark. But I understand what you mean. I know about the towns fund. That's a, a Dudley led towns fund bid that you're talking about. But even even in some of the cases of some of the devolved funding that we have, a number of our schemes, they're still retained by government. So we still have to go through their checks to make sure that we're spending money to, to time and to budget and within their um, within their rules and that's part of why the devolution deal is so significant. It's part of why a single settlement should be where we aim to get. I know that the uh, mayor sat in front of this committee and will do so again to say that, you know, we are happy to be held accountable and, and responsible um, and uh, and therefore that devolution should shift both the both the power, but also the accountability. Um, and that comes back to why this board um, is so important as, as long as well, you know, sitting alongside of audit risk and assurance um, because we're anticipating those transfers will be happening and that accountability will be here, which makes the role of boards like this um, even more important. But it's a journey, Councillor Kettle, and we are we're firmly on it, but we're not at the end of it. I'm Fine. Thank you, Lord. Uh, so it, it, just picking up on Councillor Kettle's um, point, just as a reminder for people, um, and I know you're only using this as an example, Councillor Kettle, about the hoops that have to be jumped through, but everything to do with transport now will go to the Transport Scrutiny mm -hmm. Committee. So this committee won't have any oversight of anything to do with transport. But, you know, we've had exactly the same problems as you're describing with other aspects of the, of the budget. So, yeah. you know, it is a, it is a valid point. Um, if I see no other questions, I'll move on on the agenda then. And that brings us on to number nine. And over to you, Laura, to um, continue your reports on priorities and challenges. I'm going to just stand up mostly because I'm worried I'm going to fall through that chair. <laughs> if I get overly excited and I'll come down here and 
Uh, I've always been told I have a loud voice. If you need me to use a microphone, if anybody can't hear me, let me know. But uh, being quiet has never been my problem. Um, so this is actually quite basic. And as I look around the room, I realize that most of you have been on one of our committees before. So probably what might be helpful is if I go through it fairly quickly and then we'll get the most probably from a conversation or a discussion if, if that's helpful. So just wanting to just start at the very beginning. So what is the vision of this organization? What are our values? Um, our vision is to create a more prosperous and better connected West Midlands, which is fairer, greener and healthier. And we do that through the values that we ask um, everyone who works at the combined authority to uphold, which is to be collaborative. And that is not just internally collaborative, that's externally collaborative with all the partners that we have uh, around the region to be driven, to be inclusive and to be innovative. So that is the vision of what we're here to do that, you know, this is this is why the people who uh, come to work in this building, uh, come in every day and, and they genuinely, it's about having a passion for the region and wanting to make it um, uh, fairer and greener and healthier, more prosperous and better connected. So that's what you should hold us to. That's why we're here. Those are the values I expect our officers to demonstrate uh, to you as committee members. Um, our role. We have the sort of strange things. I, I often joke it combined authority is a, is quite a terrible name for something because it doesn't exactly tell you what it does. Um, in some cases, we're combined. In some cases, we're not combined. In some of the work we do, we're an authority. And in some work we do, we're not an authority. So I thought it would just be useful to set this out a little bit. So in some areas of the combined authority, we do deliver and commission services and we operate services. So. As part of the public transport system, as you know, we uh, we are the owner and the operator of the Metro, but we don't own and operate the bus. We own a lot of the bus stations, but we, you know, we don't, and we own a lot of the car parks, but we don't run the trains. So complicated. So in some areas we are owner operator and some we aren't. And then in some areas we have statutory responsibilities for uh, commissioning services. And of course the provision of adult skills budget is a really good example for that. So there are two elements to this authority where we have statutory responsibilities. We have statutory responsibilities around elements of the transport network. We have statutory responsibilities around the AEB budget. So just important to make that really clear. Um, in other areas, we are conveners and guiders. So. This is where we are trying to bring people together, where we're trying to learn from our partners, find examples of good practice which happen all over the region and help to share that out. But to, it, it's in, it, to develop our economic strategy, our economic strategy is not a statutory strategy, but obviously the economy of the West Midlands as a whole. So, so we'll develop some strategies which aren't statutory, but they are there to try to support things our regional businesses, our housing strategy. Again, we're not a planning authority, your planning authorities, but our, our vision is to help to do things that are helpful, like a, a define affordable housing for what it means for this region and not use a national uh, framework and to, to help target money into brownfield sites, but they're your sites to bring forward. Um, so again, in some places we are acting as conveners, we are acting as guiders, we're trying to help develop strategies that then are over to local authority partners who have responsibility, who have such a responsibility to deliver some of that. So that's a, a different space again. Um, and then a, a very significant bit of what we do is advocacy. So we have a big role in advocacy. So our role is to amplify the voice of our partners, to amplify the voice of our region, to try to solve shared challenges. And I'll, I'll come back to Brownfield land as a really good example of that something quite unique to our region and specifically parts of the black country where we can't get schemes away because we've got real challenges around brownfield land advocating that to government getting them to release some funding so that it can be targeted here so again as an intermediary but as as um as an advocate so being able to say what our challenges are being able to secure powers and resources that ultimately then can flow down to our partners where they're the, the level that is most appropriate to deliver so in some cases 
we're deliverer, deliverers, if I can say that properly. In some cases, we are enablers, and in some cases, we are influencers. So again, quite complicated, and it's different across the whole of the organization, but that is essentially our role. And we, again, should be, as officers, held to account by overview and scrutiny, and others to make sure that we are, uh, we are doing what is within our remit, um, and we are doing that uh, as best as we possibly can for the region. Uh, we have six aims. You'll find these in the um, in our business plan, uh, which um, we developed these after the last election. Um, we engaged across all of our partners, the Young Combined Authority, to try to uh, use evidence and data, identify the key challenges in the region, and set out the six aims uh, that will help us realize our vision. So the first is to promote inclusive economic growth in every corner of our region. The second is to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to benefit uh, from everything that we do. But the third is to connect our communities by delivering transport and unlocking housing and regeneration sites. The fourth is to reduce carbon emissions to net zero and enhance the environment. The fifth is to secure new powers and resources from central government. And the sixth is to develop our organization and develop our role as a good regional partner. Um, and so everything we do, and if you look at our business plan, all of our activity is set out under those uh, six aims and they cross departments. So you'll have executive directors and directors here from different elements of this organization. But of course, everything we do is cross cutting. I think that's probably the last slide, but what I would say is also that um, a really good example of, of why we set up a combined authority and I pick on transport because as many of you know, that's my background, but um, the point of being combined is, is I often say is to get two and two to make five. So it used to be that we might design um, a, a bus interchange station. Uh, and Dudley Interchange is a good example of this. So we would have just designed a bus station and we're quite good at that, but we would base that on uh, the ways that we know buses need to pull in and then pull out and be able to turn in the facilities that bus drivers might need. Now, when we're looking at a bigger scheme like the interchange, we're not just thinking about that bus station. We might be thinking about whether it's possible to build housing above that bus station and use some of that housing money to help finance the bus station. We might be thinking about whether uh, we have a green living roof on top of that bus station for the first time and whether in fact inside that station, um, we might have uh, facilities that help pinpoint specific people to our uh, skills programs that are are there, or we're dealing with homelessness and we're trying to uh, put put a way into a bus station that both accommodates for people and then supports people getting assistance. So we, the whole point of the combined authority is to bring together that public pound that we spend and to get a bigger impact from it. And to do that, we really need to be better connected. And as a, as the chief exec, my focus really internally is on making sure we don't miss any of those opportunities. So if we are going to use a housing developer to develop a, a big new site, then we're making sure that the skills team is talking to that housing developer about what skills do they need and actually how are we going to make sure we train local people for those jobs. And then actually, if that's going to be a site that's going to, for the next however many years, employ that many people, how are we connecting that to the community? Is there a bus service? Do we need to do something bespoke? So it's trying to genuinely think in an integrated way about everything that we do. And that's a challenge for the organization because the way we grew, because we grew as a transport authority and then started to do some work around skills, then some stuff on housing, now into the environment. And because the relationship with government keeps changing, we keep growing and expanding. Our big challenge to ourselves is never to work in silos and just to always to see that cross cutting implication of where we could be getting more bang for our buck if we did stuff differently. So again, that's just um, if that's really important to me. So it's also really important to, to me to say that to you because that's part of what you're here to to help us make sure that we're doing it every turn. So your helpful challenge on issues like that would be really welcome. And then finally, and I will stop talking, Dan said at the beginning, um, and I hope uh, you will have heard, if you came to the induction, which many of you probably didn't need to do, but you will have heard the mayor say that as 
we grow and through this Devo deal, the role of scrutiny is becoming more and more important. It's in the devolution deal, the increased scrutiny that we will be expecting. So it's a really big and really important role that scrutiny plays in this organization. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful for you all to be on this committee because it's quite a big job. So I'll stop there, but I'm really happy to take questions. Thanks very much. And just to say um, that I think the focus of our scrutiny this year with looking at the annual business plan and aligning to the aims and the outputs, um, I think that will give us, I think it will give us more focus in, in how we undertake the business planning. So, Councillor Waters. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Laura. These, 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 your two slides, could they be made into a simpler version to actually get out there on the internet? And like you've got the, in, the screens in the bus stations at the moment, you're doing a fantastic job on promoting education. Now, if those screens were actually used for the simplified job of explaining what the combined authority can and can't do, because I'm an avid bus user, and I actually end up explaining to people that that's not under the combined authority, you know, and so forth and so on. And if it's there straight in front of them and they're looking looking at the bus, for the bus, they'll actually take it in if it's a simplified version. It's just a matter of doing that to, to understand what we can and we can't do. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Dan, we'll pick that up. Um, it, it is a it's a tough elevator pitch. There's no doubt. We but we often say when you work here, you know, it's not like it's easy to describe when somebody says, well, where do you work and what do you do? You know, you need to take the lift for about you know six hours to try to explain it. So we are working really hard to try to simplify what is a combined authority, what does it do and what doesn't it do? So that's helpful. And those are our our assets. So we should be putting those simplified messages out on our assets. I certainly think there's um, a work to be done in terms of how residents of the West Midlands see the importance of the CA and understand its functions. And I don't think um, we're anywhere near where we need to be on that yet. Yeah. But um, Councillor Actor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief Executive, for the presentation. Um, <coughs> You touched upon uh, the learning up uh, a bit early on. Um, combined authority was set up by the local <coughs> leaders. It was a local decision to set up. And now we've seen that the decision will be imposed on the region. More power will be given to the mayor or maybe Secretary of State will actually make a decision to, for example, there are talks going on behind the scenes to expansion, potential expansion of the WMCA, which is fine. But there is no local say on it. If the Secretary of State make a decision, we can't scrutinize it, can we? We can't scrutinize that decision. The decision must be made locally. The local local leader and local people should make a decision for extension. For example, if we bring in the Warwickshire County into the West Midland Command Authority, you may get a few more tour events, that's fine. However, there will be a huge ramification of bringing the Warwickshire County Council into the West Midland. Because it's not just, a, it's got very complex local government system there. It's got six districts. Will all six districts will be the constituent member of the combined authority? We're not sure. Warwickshire County Council, the transport authority, has got many hundred of miles of local bus routes with a hugely subsidized. Many of their road network is poorly maintained. That will eat our own budget. These, these things need to be looked at very, very, very closely. It's not just the decision for the 1% to gain some critical gain. That's fine. I'm, I'm not against it. Anybody can join me. But that decision must be made locally, and we should must consider the implications of bringing somebody into the West Middle. Thank you, Jeff. So, so this is a difficult one as an officer, so let me be really clear about what I understand. So if Warwickshire County Council would like to make an application to join the combined authority, that is a decision that they have to take as a county council. As the law stands today, that that application would be considered 
by the combined authority board. So as a as an officer of the combined authority, I have no and our officers have no role in that process. If Telford wanted to join the combined authority, it's up to Telford's uh, council to decide they would put together a scheme, they would make a decision, they'd take it out to public consultation, and then they would have to consult with the Secretary of State. So as an organization for us, we have we, we have nothing to do in the process. The bill, as was the question earlier, the bill as proposed, which is a bill that's led by government and, and not by us, would change how that happens. Uh, and that is quite clear. If we get a proposal at the minute, as far as I'm aware, Warwickshire's uh, cabinet hasn't approved even going forward to explore it. If they were to explore it uh, as an organization, we would look at uh, the two big items that you've put forward. One is how would voting work in a democratic way? And the other would be how would we make sure there was no financial detriment to our existing authorities? So should that happen, I can give you my commitment that I, as this organization, will understand those implications. But I do want to be really clear, we have no role to play. Uh, and as 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 officers, it is it, it's it's certainly not a decision for us to take. What is our job is to make sure that our members understand the implications. Um, if they have a say and to be open and transparent about all of it. But as I understand, Warwickshire County Council are considering it and they have a meeting, I believe this week or Thursday, their cabinet meeting, those papers are in the public domain uh, where they're going to decide whether or not they want to explore it as an option. But that's as far as we've gotten. Uh, and to my knowledge, no other authority is taking any other papers to their cabinets or councils yet either. However, a number of councils have in the past asked about the process. But as we stand here today, that is that is what I know. And I'll always be happy to come and be open, transparent about what we know and what we're doing. I think if we can request that regular updates of board to this meeting as and when anything might happen, um, that would be really helpful. But do we have a date yet that um, for the levelling up bill? Do, we, do you think it will go through Parliament? I don't. I don't know. Um, I think the the what's in the public domain this late summer, but it's in the House of Lords at the minute. It's been delayed already, um, so I don't know. I, that's where it is in the process, as far as I'm aware. I think we were expecting it originally back in March, weren't we? And um, yes, yeah, so a significant delay. So. Watch this space, I guess, on parliamentary on parliamentary process. Uh, Councillor Burrows. I just wanted to pick up on this earlier question about communications and people understanding. I, as I think, as a scrutiny committee, I think we ought to look at this. And you've just given the best explanation I've ever heard. <laughs> Is it the if only you, explanation you've ever heard? <laughs> if you can put that in pictures, yeah. I think we might start beginning to crack it and we, it's not only the televisions that are sitting in bus stations, but it is that very simple. Here we've got a project. And we're putting trees on the top. We're doing educational skill. I mean, to me, that was the clearest explanation of why you have a combined authority. That people will understand, that ordinary residents will understand, because so much of the stuff is that so yeah. I over here, even I struggle to understand it. Well, that's really helpful. We can absolutely do that. And the other thing I've spoken to the chair about is one thing we would like to do this year is as officers, we would like to spend more time in your councils, in your cabinets or your scrutiny committees being held to account by you as our members about what we are doing. So we've, I think uh, Julia's got somebody joining her team and, and our, our goal is to be out quarterly in each authority to be taking people through this. Because I also know that sometimes back in your own authorities, people don't understand the combined authority. They don't understand the role that you're playing 
and how important it is on scrutiny. So I think we can work if we can work through um, and that's again, that's one with Julia, who's been doing a great job progressing it. We can start to do a much better job about communicating who we are, what we do, why it matters and, and why your role at the combined authority matters. And that might also be helpful back in each local authority. And we've got some really good more detailed work on you know what it means in Walsall, what it means in Wolverhampton, what we've been doing, what you know, the kinds of things we've been involved in. So I'm really keen to do that this year as well. And I hopefully that will also help raise the profile. Councillor Bateman. Thank you, Chair. Um I think Chief Executive, um, I've got a couple of observations and and maybe a question. Um, in terms of the observations, I thought your explanation um, relating to the way in which the uh, um, the different levels of responsibility that's in place at the moment from the direct in terms of uh, public transport to the ones that are perhaps not quite so direct at the moment, but may well be at some future step. I, I, I don't know whether it's by my, my North American background, but I fastened on the point that you were making in relation to explaining uh, the, str the strategy that was around Dudley bus station and the potential if you use the other parts of uh, uh, of the responsibilities if then when they come either through leveling up or um, the simulated over a time where you can look at the bus station do like say in Toronto where they bus station or tram station if you want, or Essen if you would like to, to look at Germany. A level underneath there, a shopping complex. Then on top of that, maybe a small business and then the retirement homes and the apartments above, all of whom have a pet pass to travel on the bit. I, I leapt at that and I thought to myself, thank goodness. Um, and that might be um, that might well come to fruition as you look forward, because that has to be the way forward, using space, using the airspace in a way that is both beneficial in terms of transportation, but also economically beneficial. And of course, in terms of now the the, the climate and, and the like. So I, I, I think on that point of view, this is a great big tip. And the rest of the observations, you know, this is a mess of pottage that we have here at the West Midlands Combined Authority. I come from the county council where the strategic roles and responsibility was well laid out and the lines of communication were short and crisp and the arguments at the time for the county guy was they were arm's length away from the members of the public now i know having sat on wolverhampton since 1984 um my people in wentzville north now have very little understanding of where the issues have gone about waste disposal, about police and fire. You just don't go to one person. You have to find it. If you go to a councillor, there's a good chance that they won't understand where the waste disposal that's been taken from your from your bin is ending up, or the roles in between. And in actual fact, was the stuff that we've placed in our bin that as um, uh, as reusable ever gets reused, or is it mixed with the same lot that? goes down um, to the to, to the fiery pits that uh, provide um, the combustibility. It's a mess of pottage now. Um, and I'm not sure because even now as we're trying to weave our way through what's coming our way in relation to levelling up that we know. I think there were 63 objections in the House of Lords to various parts of the of the levelling up bill. Um, and I, I think it would be useful for this authority to uh, to give a um, uh, an up to date situation where we are in re with regard to it now that uh, now we've set ourselves up and it's the first meeting, so we can at least understand um, of, of where we are. I think it's absolutely crucial. Uh, I've been noticing and I've been just looking at the press coverage of. Uh, the issues that uh, Councillor Actar raised in relation to to Warwickshire. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there in the press at the present moment. Um, 
but I certainly would like to see something coming from ourselves that was um, chair that was concise and to the point about where we are today um, so that we can start to understand and follow in a way that that's got some coherency and some cohesion because I don't think that's the case at the present moment. Um, and I do think that um, we have a duty really to understand it, uh, to at least be act as the disciples back in our, our various local authorities. And if we don't understand it right up to the time, how, what chance have you got of moving forward and trying to explain to people um, with the, uh, the communications uh, resource requirement uh, of, of what it's about? There's going to be gaps all over the place. So I think from my point of view, I would like to be an informed member of, the, of, of, of this um, particular scrutiny um, role. And to do that needs an up-to-date um, paper about where we are and what we're at. Things that we can do, not about the ifs and buts, but the things that we know is coming and the, and the issues. And also we understand a little bit of about a, a timetable that the government are, 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 are running. Um, whether it's with the mayor or with or the individual authorities that make up um, part of, uh, of the combined authority. I think we need to know what the actual is rather than try to speculate about the potential. And if we get to know what the actual is, then I think we might be in a better position to be uh, leaders in these debates rather than also around or people sitting on the sidelines watching it. I think that's absolutely crucial. So, Chair, um, thank you very much for the presentation in relation to that. I think it was really good, Chief Exec, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I think, but I do think we need to be much more informed than we are before we start uh, getting too excited about what may be. So I'll leave it with the Chair to decide and Vice Chair to decide on the agendas. We are always happy to come and give you whatever updates that you want between Julia and myself and Helen as our monitoring officer. We will be able to give you the facts as, as we see them. Uh, the fact today is that the, nobody has applied to join the combined authority. Thanks. And I think if I can just say, I'll bring you back in, Phil. Um, hopefully by the time we have our meeting in September, if the time frame hasn't slipped yet again, um, the bill may well have gone through Parliament at that point. So we would be in a much clearer position to understand the facts, as, as you say, that we need to, and you're quite right, we do. Um, but until that bill has gone through, whether it's amended, how it's amended, what might be in it at that point, I think we, you know, we, we can only at this point surmise, can't we? So it is a case of waiting, of seeing what comes forward and hopefully by that date we will know that so you, did you want to comment back it's just a, a, a comment it's an aside really. i meant to say it at the front so that i could get it out and i'm blinking well didn't um, <laughs> the interesting part for, for me is that in the old days of the county council just as it was being round up derek hender and the uh, uh, Policy and Resources Committee of the County Council engaged Cooper's Library to do a report about what, what the arrangements would look like going into the future and the potential. In Coventry, you have that in your archives because you were the lead authority in relation to archives. I would very much like to see it and read it now, bearing in mind we're about to go forward again into making more decisions than the like. And as you know, often the future is encased in the history. So I certainly, if it's a possibility, I would like to see that. It's a Cooper's Library report. It was about the future of the, uh, the future arrangements going forward. It would probably be done in the, almost the last dying days of the authority, so it'd be around about 85, 86. Thank you very much. I reckon Dan's probably got a copy anyway, but uh, if not, I'm sure Dan will pick up the action to get in touch with officers at Coventry. I didn't realise kept the archive, and uh, yeah, we'll see what we can find. That's the kettle. If I may, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we got to the end of the year, and uh, the reality was that there, there wasn't a budget for the running costs of the CA. 
is the narrow budget in place for the continuous year upon year running costs of a budget there to to cover the running costs of the, of the CA? We have a one year budget and obviously Louise will uh, contradict me if I get this wrong. Um, the problem that we have at the moment is um, almost entirely around the subsidy of the bus network. So at the moment, what we have is um, patronage that is about 80% of pre pandemic patronage. Uh, and as you know, with the cost of energy and the cost of interest and the driver settlement, we have costs that are about 110% of they were. <laughs> we are in the process of negotiating, hopefully, what the network will be until the end of 2024. And as you may you may know, if if our commercial bus operators uh, decide to deregister a service and take it out of service because it's not commercial, this authority has an obligation to test that against its against its accessibility standard. So we have standards that say people need to be this close to a, a bus shot a bus station, a bus shelter, a bus service. If it is deemed socially necessary, then we have to pay the cost of running that service. So at the moment, Councillor Kettle, the, the budget is in good shape and the financial monitoring reports you will see come through and audit risk insurance can, can attest to that. However, if the bus companies, and I think this will not happen because I said we're in a very good negotiating position with them. If they were to deregister our network down to say 60%, which is what's happened in other parts of this country, the difference between the services they run and, the, and we would have to then assess all those services against our standards. And if they are socially necessary, then we would have to pick up the cost. That has been the budget challenge that is set within our budget that we've been trying to assess. So um, that has been that's been our very big uh, challenge. And of course, we would want to provide those services because leaving our most vulnerable people without bus services is not something we want to do. Hang on, Laura, you, yeah. I think you went off into tangent. No, that is the that's the that's been why we haven't been able to agree a final budget number for five years because it's we haven't been able to bottom out what that yes, number is. You bring in, yeah. I was talking about the running costs of the CA itself. So, Over the years, we've got to the end of the year, and people have said, there isn't any budget beyond X, Y, Z. You know, do we still have a job at the end of the year? And that happened uh, a few years ago. What I'm getting at is, within the package that has come into the West Midlands Combined Authority, are the running costs within that package covered? The cost of running the authority yes. is 100% covered. Okay. Uh, last question from Councillor Waters. Thank you, Chair. It's not really a question. It's actually to back up what you've just said. Now, one of my local services, the 35A, has been run by a diamond bus service. And they've decided now not to be running that service. So now the tender has now gone out and Chase Rider actually took over that service. So I, I know that that service is actually subsidised by the combined authority and the combined authority have made an agreement with Chase Rider for them to run the, the, the bus service. So I can actually see exactly where you're coming from on that. And the thing is, when the bus service is such a big big part of the combined authority. OK, it's not part of this committee, We're not with that now, but it is a big part because there's a lot of people that actually need to get from A to B, such as myself, who don't drive. So we do need those bus services. Thank you. If you go back to the, the, the vision, you know, it's a fairer, greener, healthier, better connected. None of those things happen without an efficient and clean public transport service that's affordable. So we will we will we will not be hitting our vision at all if we can't um, maintain a, a strong network. And I promise we're doing everything we possibly can to negotiate that settlement for as long as we can. We've seen up and down the country where where 
uh, they've had a massive reduction in service and just what that's done to the most vulnerable. We're trying to avoid that at all costs. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Laura, for, for that presentation and for answering the questions. And I've picked up um, a few recommendations that we've discussed with that, and those will be incorporated in the minutes. I'll discuss them with Lindsay. Can we get those slides? Sure. Yeah, I think we've had them. You've already got them? Yeah, they, yeah, they came out. Yeah, I've got them, yeah. Uh, okay, so that takes us then on to agenda item 10, which is a scrutiny review and the impact of delivery of local skills training following the devolution of the AEB to the CA. Uh, Amanda, do you want to present the report, please? Thank you, Chair. So I'll do a brief introduction and then I'll hand over to Claire to talk through specifics of, of the report. Um, just for the committee's benefit, uh, just a, a reminder that the review group was set up with most of the members here. Um, Martin's not here today. Um, and we heard, <clears throat> excuse me, a range of evidence from public sector, private sector and other stakeholders in the adult education budget uh, sector. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting Dan's presentation, you know, it's clear link back there in terms of scrutiny and the link to partnerships. And that was an important part of, of this particular re review. Um, I think from across the range of stakeholders who gave evidence into the review group, it was really interesting that there was a lot of positives in terms of the devolution of AEB and how that's been managed and, and viewed to be successful. There was a lot of commonality in the evidence that people gave, but also there was a lot of other issues that were raised. And I think in terms of some of the issues raised, there were wider system issues that were beyond the specific remit of, of the review, which was looking at adult education budget. However, you'll see that these are picked up within the report and, and addressed within some of the recommendations. Um, so it was a, a, a positive review in the sense that um, it's achieved the objective that was set out within the original brief uh, in terms of deeming uh, the appropriate and certain success of devolution of AEB, but also then looking at other system changes and other uh, amendments and recommendations that can be taken forward. So I'll hand over to Claire just to say thank you to members of the group, to Lindsay and, and specifically to Claire. Too. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Amanda. Um, I just thought I'd start by just um, reminding people of the purpose of the adult education budget as we see it. As, as Laura's just done for that, sometimes I think we, we talk about it in a way we're not quite sure exactly what it's there to do. So the adult education budget, £130 million a year devolved to us to, to provide skills and education and training to do four main things to help our residents get into work if they're not working to help residents get higher level qualifications that help them get better jobs the sort of skills that employers need and they can take advantage of the good jobs in the region and they can earn more money um, to give people a good basic education where they haven't been able to get it at school for any reason or, or in other countries that they may have come from for whatever reason anyone that's not got that good basic education to be able to get the numeracy literacy and digital basic skills they need and then finally to help support our communities to help support community cohesion to help people support people with their wider health outcomes social prescribing to build stronger communities so four things we try to do with the budget it is a big budget. It is quite all encompassing, really. And I think that's probably why when we did the review, it was hard to keep it just to the budget because it's so interdependent in the ecosystem in which it sits in its localities, in its communities, in its business. So so we had a really good debate, I think, about lots of, of the issues and, and emerging themes. But it, some of it was wider than the specific budget. But I think hopefully we tried to capture that in the review as well. So what I wanted to do was just to, just to go through some of the emerging um, themes and considerations just put a little bit of meat on the bones of some of what's in the report for you um i think as amanda said overall it was a it was a positive um review in that there was strong agreement about the role that um, having a devolved adult education budget had been able to play in the region in supporting both residents and businesses 
and I think the the um the benefits of having that devolved over having it done from a national perspective did come through strongly so that was that was good um I think there was a real shared view about the partnership approach that had been taken in the in the um delivery of the adult education budget and the strength of the sort of team West Midlands approach between WMCA, its constituent authorities, and Job Centre Plus, actually, and, and also with employer organisations, although more to do. And I think a recognition from everybody that although there was a good partnership approach, we need to continue to evolve that and work more deeply on that partnership approach, particularly in local places, to make sure that we're really, really maximising the budgets. Um, we had quite a lot of debate about the budget, about whether it's a resident or a business driven budget. And at the heart of it, the adult education budget is a resident facing budget. It is about making sure residents can access the skills, but but very cognizant of um, employers needing skilled people and employers being in some way the customer as well. And we talked quite a lot about the role of employers and how, how we needed to bring that in and make sure that the services that we were providing to residents um, met employer demand and needs as well. And that's quite a, a tricky thing to balance sometimes, but I think there was there was quite a lot of discussion about how we best did that. And, and partnership was, was one of the ways, but I think a recognition more needed to be done in terms of working with employers as well to, to make them understand the benefits of taking on um, different residents, residents a much more inclusive approach to employment as well to meeting skills needs in the region. Um, so, so quite a lot there. Um, and we had a big debate about careers information for, um, for residents. And again, it's not an adult education budget specific service, but it's absolutely critical to the functioning of the skills system, which is why through the devolution discussions, we sort of pushed so hard um, to, to have careers as part of the Devo settlement because we know the absolute criticality to, to delivering that. So um, just a few other points um, to make. I think we examined um, in looking at how the adult education budget was positioned to be able to respond to the current labour market and the near term challenges that the labour market um, was experiencing was that um, there's been so much churn and challenge recently in the labour market with, with coming out of the pandemic with Brexit and much more to come um, and a changing labour market in terms of technically low levels of unemployment now but greater levels in inactivity and the budget needs to be able to flex, the provision needs to be able to flex to respond to those challenges and again just, just testing some of the, the partnership working on that and how we can do that more quickly um, to, to be able to respond to those challenges somewhere we've still got more work to do I think to be able to do that and a lot of discussion around good work um, a bit of attention about getting people into first jobs through training and that being really important but secondly the challenge of making sure people are in good work for themselves and their and their families and their communities that they're earning you know a, a good wage and they can progress as well so again tensions about should how should we best use the budget um, around that um, and I think then the, the rest of the, the discussions did centre much around careers, around um, employment support, um, employer support through UKSPF and, and the wider place of um, adult education budget in the landscape. And I think because it is a devolved service, it has very much become a driver for some of the other activity around it. And I think this is this is to Laura's point about where we are an influencer in the system. So we are a direct deliverer of the skills um, and, and the products, but we use this budget and our and our role in it to actually influence and shape the partnership working and our partners' agendas. We use it to influence how Job Centre Plus work with our colleges and local authorities and training providers. And so it's a useful lever in that way. We, we haven't managed to maximise that in careers as yet. There's much more for us to do, and I don't think we've managed to maximise how we then influence employers as well through it. So I think we're much further along the journey with the partners and probably less so, as I say, with, with, with careers and employers at the moment. Um, but overall, I think those were the, my findings um, from it. I thought it was a very helpful review for us as officers um, to consider and um, just reminded us what a, a breadth of scope we, we cover with the budget as well. But thank you, Jack. Thanks for that and um, a big thanks to everybody who was involved in that particular deep dive. I know it takes a lot of extra time so I want to thank everybody who gave their time to do that. Just a, a quick question from me, what, um, what, what, what are the gaps that you've highlighted 
So I know I've, you, you've sort of talked about the, the gap with um, sort of partnership we're working yeah. on. Is there a specific, is there something more tangible that you want to pick up over the coming year? Um, I think it, it's the it's the employer side. I think we went through strongly from the review was how, how it linked to um, employer behaviour and, and, and um, meeting directly meeting employers needs. So whilst we were really um, moving with the partnerships in localities for communities, the connection there to, to maybe employers and them understanding what the adult education budget could do for them in terms of training people, that bit we felt was underdeveloped. So if there was anything, I think uh, that would be the area we'd want to work on. Thank you. And I know that the, this deep dive came out as a result of the um, work that we've done on the Black Country, um, I don't know how many years ago now, it feels a very long time ago. Um, and that isn't specifically referenced within this. So that might be a sub piece of work that we might need to keep up and address, I think, going forward. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a really, it's such a huge, huge area to focus down. I appreciate it really, really complex and, and really difficult. Um, so I've got Council the Waters. Thank you, Chair. There's one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I consider rather a big point, and we did discuss it, and that was regarding those who cannot <coughs> take an exam, who are absolutely fantastic at manual work, you give them you give them instructions, show them what to do, and they can do it. But you sit them in a classroom and they are not going to achieve it. And I'll give you an example of it. Talking to this gentleman, and he said he'd gone to Warsaw College. And I saw that's nice. What did you do? And he muttered. And I went, sorry, what did you say? English and maths. And he said, I dropped out because of X, Y, Z. And that that guy his communication and everything like that was really good, but it was actually, he felt as though he was being pushed behind because he wasn't getting the little bit of help that he needed. And he is now good at sitting at an exam. He's now good at doing that because he actually told me that. Then on the other, on the lighter side, I was talking to a lady for, who works in Job Centre Plus. She's a work coach in Wolverhampton, and she was telling me of some of the fantastic work she's doing along the lines of this. She's actually recognising when one of her clients is that way, cannot achieve that, and she's finding other ways for them to actually access jobs and actually work through it. So it is happening out there, but not as much as what it should be doing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's that's the thing about the join up with other budgets. Um, so there is a part of the adult education budget through the community learning, which is less exam based. We have other funding streams like skills boot camps, exactly that. They do all the skills, but there's no exam in there. So, And this comes to careers advice, I think, because there are so many products out there. It's helping people navigate that, like the work coach in that example. So we get the right fit for every individual. So I'm confident those services do exist, probably not as much as they should. And it's a case of helping people navigate and find the right one, which is why it's, it's really important we do the work on careers as well. But yes, absolutely. And I've just got an additional question. Um, so uh, it, it's not, well, it's, it is directly, it is related to this paper. So um, a few months ago, when we were presentations at CA board, um, gave some really, really good statistics, or I couldn't write them down quickly enough, um, about the levels of worklessness um, and the age profile of worklessness within the region. Um, and some of that was, yeah, some of those statistics were very, very concerning. So in terms of setting yourself KPIs as, as, an, as a, a department to measure the success of your delivery against the worklessness figures, is that, is that there? We're just at the moment partway through developing an outcomes framework so that we're, we're actually looking at the outcomes for residents and we can do that. It is a rapidly changing picture, though, um, in terms of worklessness as well. Uh, we've got some real stubborn pockets, but if you look at 
what um, a few months ago, everyone was talking about the over 50s and, and, and the crisis, um, you know, in, since the pandemic. Now, two thirds of those have returned to the labour force now uh, on the latest numbers. So every month that is changing quite a lot. So it's it's how we have a responsive model that is fleet of foot that can, that can respond to the things as they change. And but yeah, absolutely. In terms of KPIs and outcomes framework, that's something we're, we're looking at. Perhaps when you when you develop that framework, that can be shared. Thanks, Thank you, Chair. Um, in commentary, uh, particularly in my ward, we've got a large number of um, uh, ethnic minority females uh, not in jobs, and um, because there are some barriers. Uh, there are some schools offering those uh, females uh, reading writing skill, for example. Some some schools, not all of them, but which ultimately, once they learn the language that value will be removed and they can get to employment. Uh, is there anything that through this uh, order of education um, service, you do something to work with uh, those communities through the school? I think school is the best place because once the parents drop the kids off, they can go there for maybe an hour or half an hour to learn something positive which will help them get into the job better. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, so, so part of the adult education budget is a a program called community learning and within community learning one of the um one of the main programs is um family learning and it's it's exactly as you said it, it, it targets usually parents usually delivered in schools in coventry that um that is delivered through the um coventry city council adult education service so yes absolutely that that does um exist as a function of the adult education budget. okay thanks everybody so can i have committees um endorsement for the set of recommendations on page 27 and over onto page 28 and things. Vera? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you to make a comment. No, yeah, no, no, no. I'll, I'll second in that. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, committee. OK, thank you very much for, for that. Um, and that moves us on to agenda item 11. And that's the deeper devolution dealing with scrutiny implications. Obviously, we've touched on this um, a little bit already, so I'm not expecting um, this paper to take us a huge length of time. So, Dan, do you want to lead on that? <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Yes, and, and, and as you've, you've said, it's the, uh, the deeper devolution deal has, has come up a number of times uh, already this morning. Um, but the purpose of this paper and why we, we wanted to bring it to, uh, to members' attention is to, to uh, summarise and set out uh, in writing what's happened since your last meeting. So, so members who were on the committee last year will, will remember a, a significant and, and I think really useful piece of work that the committee did, um, scrutinising and supporting the submission of the, um, what's now called the Deeper Devolution Bill. Um, and uh, at, the, uh, at your meeting on the 13th of March, which you said it was, was your last meeting, you you, uh, you approved that that work and it fed into into the uh, devolution deal submission that the combined authority made to the government. So since that 13th of March meeting, and in fact two days later, um, the government announced the, the deeper devolution deal. Uh, paragraph 2.1 of the report in the appendix sets that out in more detail. And that's there for information. Um, the particular purpose of this report and where I want to focus members' attention was around uh, governance and accountability, understandably. And the, the government in the devolution deal made a, a, a very clear statement that we've, we've heard uh, Laura uh, referred to earlier and, and the mayor of the uh, members' induction that with greater uh, funding and powers must come the greater scrutiny and accountability. Um, and I think that's that's um, well, I'd say a, a, an uncontentious statement, but certainly something that that all members of this committee could be, would support. So what I've tried to do is set out in the report is is how that greater scrutiny and accountability uh, will will come about and will develop. And we haven't got the the, the finance yet because it's work in progress. But as a as a where we are today, if you look at it, uh, if you look at it like that, um. Since you last met as well, the, the government have published what they call the English Devolution Accountability Framework, which, as everything has acronyms these days, is, is EDAF. So if you hear EDAF, that means the English Devolution Accountability Framework, which is um, effectively the government's position on where it considers 
um, local authorities and combined authorities and, and, and institutions exercising delegated powers where they uh, should be in respect of scrutiny and accountability. Um, so it, um, it set out um, a number of, of, of probably categorised as broad brush statements, so it, it's, it's not heavy on detail, but, but as, a, as a position that the government expects uh, authorities exercising devolved powers to have enhanced and, and strengthened scrutiny and accountability. I think it's again, it's a, it's a good, it's a good position paper um, just to, 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 to make that clear. Now, one particular aspect of EGAF that, that will interest um, members on this committee is a commitment the government made to publish what they called a scrutiny protocol. Um, which they said would set out the relationship between the mayor, the combined authority and its scrutiny and audit functions. And I think where uh, the, the interest and, and the focus of the work of this committee should be is around that scrutiny protocol, which I can say as of today hasn't yet been published, so, so, so we can't, can't present that protocol to you, um, but it is, it is work in progress and it is being developed um, at, at the moment, and, and the um, Department for Leveling Up Housing Communities has got a, an officer working group of which Julia Cleary, sitting in the corner, is, is a member of. So we, we have someone inside the room sitting at the table and, and helping to, to influence that, that, that scrutiny protocol. Um, and then when it is published, which we're expecting certainly before the next meeting of this committee, so, so beginning of September, um, we will we will bring that protocol to to your next meeting for your input and, and, and your support. Um, and I think the next the next piece of work again we're, we're we're expecting the protocol to be to be largely generalist rather rather than, than specific. Um, but it will it will set out more clearly what the government considers good scrutiny to look like, and then the job of this committee and, and your officers is to translate that that general view of good scrutiny to what does that actually mean for the West Midlands Combined Authority, and, and how will that that new scrutiny protocol, which clearly will be the, the latest thinking and the latest view of of, of the government around overview and scrutiny, what does that mean for 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 you as a committee and and, and people doing it at, at the cold face? So, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a position paper, it's, it's for information, uh, just to, to, to let you know that's what's happening um, before your, your next meeting, because they were expecting the protocol to be published, we'll bring the paper to your next meeting for you to, to consider how that protocol gets translated into uh, the activity of the, of the combined authority. Just one last point before I, I, I finish and, and take any questions is, is if I can draw uh, your attention to uh, the, the paragraph uh, or section five of the report, because you, you may well have, have, have heard reference uh, a proposal within um, the, uh, the government have for the, the mayor to, to undertake a Q and a Q &A, or a number of Q and A sessions uh, with local MPs. And, and again, if you've, if you've sat on the committee before, you will know that scrutiny uh, have uh, two Q and A sessions with. The mayor that look at policy and budget. Um, this is a, a, a new proposal that, that has come out of the government uh, in the spring, where effectively local MPs will, will do a will do a, a, a similar function, and it's it's not instead of this committee's um, uh, work with the mayor. It's it's in addition, and it, it involves the region's MPs rather than the region's councillors. But but just wanted to to sort of flag that with you so if you're not aware of it you you, you certainly will be and I, th I think it's a it's a, an event um, and an occurrence that the, the certain members of this committee should be aware of and, and, and pay attention to even if they're not not directly involved so that's again just to, to make sure that's on your radar that the uh, that the, the Q&A sessions for the for the region's uh, MPs with the mayor uh, will be happening that the, the actual arrangements are being developed uh, but, but to say it's, it's, it's something to, to, to be aware of and I think from the government's perspective uh, is part of that jigsaw of wider scrutiny of which clearly you play a key part but but put on this as well thank you any dates John uh, Can I just come to yeah. Councillor Bateman first and then I'll come to you Councillor Kettle um, Chair 
There are two things that jump out of, of this paper for me, um, other than what we discussed previously. Um, and one is the, the implication in here, the underlining, shall we say, that the job of scrutiny is important and that the chair of the scrutiny committee should be sitting in a position that is contestable, valuable, the roles wanted rather than the buggings term. That's what that's what that said. I think that's really a, a, an important part um, for us to pick up on because uh, what they're saying is that scrutiny at the present moment isn't up to scratch. That's that's what's being said, and people have views of that. that clearly. And the second part, obviously, is the bit that we've just majored on, the mayoral scrutiny by members of parliament. Um, and that in itself, um, whilst understandable, if you were a, a member of parliament, will hold it special, I think, threats maybe uh, to local government. Um, because if we don't get it right, you know, the mayor, as he goes about trying to deliver whatever it is that he's that he or she is delivering. It's not just that one person now we talk about the position and it could be it could going forward over the next 10 years, it could be switching about a bit. I mean, the, the importance really here is that members of parliament will be having a direct say over local government matters devolved down through the levelling up process that we're going through at the moment. And that's both a, a benefit and a threat, I think. I think for local government, we have to get our levels of scrutiny up and the work that we produce um, uh, recognised on a wider basis, perhaps. And it also needs to be of a quality. Um, and I don't think any of that can be done with just a flourish and a tick over the next couple of years. It sounds to me like it would be going to be really hard work. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just fasten on those two issues because I think that for me is um, a view of where we are at the present moment. We were talking about how the CA sits and how difficult it is for residents to understand what's going on, on the, at the coal face. Um, well, look, there's an issue here that's as plain as the nose on your face, I think. And I think it's up to local government to try to improve and make itself um, uh, uh, better equipped to deliver the scrutiny um, that clearly is so re required. We will be talking about huge sums of money, whatever the actual outcome will be. And the implications of getting it wrong will be uh, severe, I, I think. Um, but the opportunities perhaps of getting it right is also, um, uh, you know, a, a, a really important point to, fa to fasten on as well. Yeah, and I, I would absolutely support you what you're saying, Phil, in terms of um, local authority scrutiny having to improve <clears throat> um, and, and, and the, the requirements that we're going to face. I'm assuming that as part of the bill, local authorities will also be subject to. So there needs to be work going on in all of our local authorities about how they're going to respond to um, the new requirements. And you're quite right, you know, sitting on any scrutiny committee very often is, you know, well, who, uh, it, it, it's not a, it's not seen as an important or critical role to undertake. And I think that has been very much the case up till now. Um, and certainly part of the, um, the idea around remuneration of, of scrutiny committees and our committee is to try to improve that importance and to give it that you know the, the importance that it deserves because it does take a lot of commitment and time on behalf of um on behalf of members who attend so i think you're absolutely right to to flag up both of those points uh councillor tenant thank you um and i also wanted to talk about point five if you bring it up because one of my concerns coming in i'll just uh, in discussion, what did you declare that it worked for one of the regions MPs? Um, I I certainly worry it's a four Q and A a year. 
it will be an event that the press very much be interested in because I, I deal with this a lot. Um, and I worry that that will overshadow those Q&As, which are likely to be fun, but that way I like it to overshadow the work of this committee, which does a lot more than just as good as the mayor. It looks like actually full functions actually is probably much more important for the day to day running the CA. So I think I'm aware that you said that nothing is kind of firm yet, but as we're drawing these plans, what work can be done to ensure this committee is that very minimum on equal footing when it comes to that panel of MPs? So whether it be the work that goes out on CA social media comms about this committee, whether it is I know, putting the chair of this committee on that panel of MPs, I'm not quite sure what the government are envisioning from this. Um, but kind of or making sure if they get four sessions of the mayor a year, can we get four sessions of the mayor? Just something to ensure that at bare minimum this committee gets equality with our MPs. Thank you. Joe, mm. if I can, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll invite Julia to, to answer that specifically because again, she's she's uh, been meeting with government to done work and, and those issues are live issues being discussed, but, but Julia can give a, a better answer than I. That, that, that on my elephant, please. Yeah, it is one of the things that we have been discussing with um, Department of Housing and Communities to make sure that whatever happens with those mayor and MP sessions, it doesn't impede or diminish or take away anything from what we're doing as scrutiny at the combined authority level or the local level. So we've been working with um, government on some very, very specific terms of reference for what for those sessions will take, those four sessions a year will take including exactly what type of questions should be asked and how those questions should be framed to make sure that they don't have you know we won't be expected to be taking reports and making recommendations and things like that it will be at that much higher level so there is a, there's a really really clear segregation between the two types of scrutiny that are going on so we're, we're working on that very very closely to make sure that, that doesn't happen that it doesn't detract or take away because i think scrutiny if you look at the the suggestions that are going to come through in the protocol the suggestions that are in the the, um, the vivo deal a lot that's in there we are already doing we, we do scrutiny well at the combined authority um, and we are getting better all the time in what we do at the combined authority and we're really really clear that we don't want these these mp and mayoral sessions to take anything away or to be duplicating anything at the combined authority level or the local level as well that they are they are set up as right for what they should be doing so yeah we will be really clear about that and we are being really clear about that and again once we've got some terms of reference and we know where we're going with that specifically we have fed back um, we sent something back a couple of weeks ago, so we're hoping again to have those draft terms of reference with us soon. We can hopefully share with you a uh, look at to make sure that there isn't that, that those issues don't arise. And we want to make sure the comms are there and the communications team here are sort of in those, in those meetings as well. So everybody is firmly in the loop of what's going to happen. Okay, so we, we get to, yeah. Um, uh, I've got Councillor Waters next, please. Can you check? Thank you, Chair. Now, I don't know whether we could actually do this, but I've had an idea. The uh, MP and mayoral sessions, I know that I could actually get feedback from my MP of what has actually been said in these sessions, and I would be very willing to actually feed that into the scrutiny committee if that's something that I am able to do. Just to confirm that the sessions will be broadcast, so they will be Right, okay. will be, will be open. We don't think at the moment that they'll be open for public to attend the meetings, but again, that's one of the things we're negotiating with the government at the minute. But they will be broadcast, that's specific in the deal text, but it must be broadcast. Yeah, so we will all be able to, to have a thought of this. So I've got Councillor Burrows and then Councillor Moore. So I, I simply wanted to make the observation that I asked to come back on this committee this year because I actually felt it did some worthwhile stuff. And this saying we don't do a good job, I don't. I actually I'm not convinced that's true because the only reason I'm here is I thought we did do a good job and I asked to be relieved of one or two others because I thought I was wasting my time. There is a bigger job to be done because we got more money. And we need to up our game, not because we were failing, but because the game's changed. And I think that is really important to actually 
in our own minds work that out. And the other thing, the other reason I've come along here is because this is not party political. Because if it was, I wouldn't waste my time. Now, I'm quite happy the MPs go and have their silly games. But this committee does fairly good work. And we can, I think, step up to the new challenge of actually scrutinising the far bigger expenditure and bigger challenges that the authorities got. And yes, there are some communication issues that we need to address, which we talked about with the general public. But at the end of the day, the general public are going to be very interested in what happens to Dudley's proverbial bus station, because that's what they're really interested in, rather than what goes on around these tables. What they want is effective delivery of service, and we're there to help that, not politic. And I don't care if my constituents never know what I do, as long as what we do actually helps the authority get the proverbial Dudley bus station sorted. As representatives from Dudley would certainly support you on that. <laughs> um, but I think that you know you've made the point quite well that actually we that we're being driven by national change. So the requirements on us are going to have to improve and change as the national changes come along. So it is a you know it it, it is kind of that, that approach. Julia, did you want to comment? Just to say, I think a lot of what will be in the protocol is not about making almost what we do better, but about raising the profile of what we do and actually getting it out there and increasing those communications between us and the combined authority board as well, making sure that, that two-way communication is there. So I think looking through what's coming out through the protocol, as I said, most of it we already are doing very well, but it's just raising the profile and getting that message and those communications out there as to what we're doing. And final question from Councillor Moore. I suppose my point really, to be honest, I mean, I can only talk from my own observations within my own council, but um, with increased devolution does require increased um, scrutiny and accountability. And, you know, other than this committee, which uh, is my first meeting today, I, I don't feel that this committee and actually the combined authority feeds currently well enough back into the local authority. Um, you know, I've never seen the minutes of this meeting ever appear at my council. Um, as an example, um, we don't regularly really have senior officers from the combined authority come to uh, the council and as the chair of scrutiny or the relatively new chair of scrutiny in Sandwell uh, over the last 12 13 months that's obviously an issue for myself to address but I'd be very interested in how the protocol is uh, mm. going to actually deal with that anomaly um, you know we need far more kind of accountability back into the authority just other than this particular committee yeah absolutely and Laura alluded earlier in one of her presentations about um, senior officers from the combined authority uh, going out into local authorities and um, various scrutiny boards and I know that's something that they're committed to. Um, in terms of representation from this committee, obviously I urge everybody in, who attends this committee to feed back into their own local authorities, but I mean I've, I've attended all the Hamptons um, scrutiny board which I'm happy to offer to do to any to just to increase and improve the links because you're quite right if local councillors don't understand the links and don't understand the importance it you know it makes going forward and makes the, the things that we want to deliver with the partnership arrangements with local authorities much harder so you're absolutely right on on the point that you 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 raised there councillor Moore. now I did say that was going to be the last point is, is it a very quick one it's just um, just come back if that's okay yeah, yeah. um so for for redditch borough council and obviously it's, that's where i'm from with that as the non-constituent local authority i write up a report which goes straight into the overview and scrutiny um every single overview and scrutiny meeting has a section where we talk about the west Midlands combined authority so i think it's uh, what it's going about when you said it's within our gift as um, members who are on here and then members in our own areas to make sure we are feeding that back we're making sure that we pass that information back but i love the idea of having the door recommend visitors i love to that's um redditch sound much more enlightened than most of the mets are if the committee wanted us to do take the minutes and do something that could be used as a standard briefing for you to feed back in, we would be delighted to do that. And again, I just reiterate, we would be happy to come to Sandwell scrutiny. We just need to be invited and then you will be sick of the side of us. 
that we'll, we'll pick that up and look at that outside of this meeting, but just to improve and strengthen those communication arrangements. I am going to move on now because we will have more detail on that paper come at, at a future meeting for us to look at. So Grant Register, I'm not sure who's picking this up, Louise or Kate? Kate? Hello, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I can't be with you today for, uh, for your first meeting. Um, just conscious of time. So obviously the grant register has come out in um, papers. There are a number of new grants that have come on since um, we last sent this to you, kind of uh, changes around the, the financial year have obviously happened since we last met. And we're now in the new financial year. So there's a number of new grants. Um, this is a little bit of a catch up in some respect. So all of those grants have been reported through the financial monitoring report that have gone through the intervening period um, to board since the committee last met. Take any questions that, that members might have around the, the grant register paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just ask a quick question? So you've, you've got the we've got the grant register, and obviously some of it is longer term than others. Um, I'm presuming that with any single settlement made by the devolution deal, um, there will be nothing lost in terms of grants already received, but not yet um, spent. Or don't we know that yet? Um, no, so in terms of, yes, ultimately, so if we have a grant end date and that goes over the single settlement, our expectation would be that that grant sort of stay there effectively um, within there. What we are now seeing, obviously, the, the date of single settlement coming is co certainness with the next uh, CSR review within central government. So certainly a lot of the funds that we are now seeing through central government, the end date is kind of correlated with when we will move into single settlement anyway. So the overlap period will be quite uh, I guess quite small really um, in terms of that but yes where we have grants that go over that we would expect to hold those grants for that purpose in that period. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bateman? Taking a bit of a taking a bit of a flyer chair but on the grant the capital um, grants register on the on the back the, the schedule the top one talks about major schemes uh, about metro extension. Can I ask the question, when are we adding our ex extension, our 700 <laughs> metres that's taken years to develop? Is there a date coming for it? Because uh, to say that Wolverhampton has been um, frustrated by it would be kind of underplaying oh, yes, the words. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just frustrated as Dudley. Is there anything, have you got a quick answer to that, Kate? Because obviously that does step over into, into transport scrutiny. It, it does, yes. And obviously, um, I think as it has been previously communicated to, to Wolverhampton to Officers, so there is um, no move from that date. But we can certainly get you an update from our, our transport colleague uh, yes. for that, unless Laura has one. Next summer. <laughs> <laughs> careful about that cheap <laughs> <laughs> but seriously the, the issue you should be aware of the, the, the feeling of um, oh, no. much anger uh, in relation to it and it does affect the ability of people to take the words that come out of the WMCA with any yeah. sense of, 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 of depth pick it up outside we are working with the city we have some extra requirements we're trying to accommodate do I have any other questions on the grant register, Kate? No? Thank, thanks, Kate, for that. And, Thank um, you. Have a lovely Kate, day. Thank you very much. So Bye-bye. So agenda item 13 is the uh, overview and scrutiny work programme for the coming year. As we said at the start, it's very much a work in progress. So if things come up during the, the discussions, we can um, slot things in and we do say need to discuss how we are going to incorporate some scrutiny, some distinct scrutiny work with, with Laura and Laura's team. Councillor Tennant. Yeah, I just had a, a couple of things on this. Um, so there's nothing on here, obviously the deal's huge, absolutely huge. Um, there's nothing on the work programme as of yet, obviously previous report talks about bringing a scrutiny report to the Hunts meeting. Um, so if we can fit that in somewhere. Um, but also on the 4th of September meeting, we've got stuff about homes, which is always very great. Um, 
if we had to deliver inclusive growth, which is the four priority on that list of priorities, Laura showed us earlier, transport needs to be integrated into how we're building homes. So is it possible for an officer from transport development, whatever it's called, um, to be at a meeting alongside the housing team to ensure that we're doing those joint discussions? And this is where I know it's going to become messy um, yeah. in terms of what's transport scrutiny remit and what is the overview of the scrutiny remit because we know yeah. that for everything is flawed in the state, there is an overlap. So I'm not sure how we manage that, Dan, if I'm completely honest. Um, I mean, I, I, yes, I think it's, it's, it's the short answer. It should be, should be long to, to answer a question if, if, if you have it, if it's a transport question relating to housing. That house for a question related to transport. Um, but but yeah, it, it, I think just just as a committee need to be mindful that it is a question that we could find a, a, just a, an answer of fact. Then then uh, if it helps your your consideration of the wider item. Then then absolutely, it's just if it was then to lead on to um, a particular issue relating to transport, the, the, the correct process would be then for this committee to refer it to. Uh, to the transport delivery solution committee, but I, 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 I think so many of these services are cross cutting that we're just going to have to work away and yeah, these, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely these, these issues during the uh, during the year. But I, I don't see any reason why a, 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 a TFWM officer should be here to, to help clarify issues if they call I guess it's more around strategy yeah. than it would be about it's any not single project delivery. Delivery. Yeah, yeah, it's about strategy. So as long as I think we're clear, that would be the, that would be the direction. I think we can we can probably do that. Anything else on the work plan, from Councillor Burrows? Oh, we spend an awful lot of money on regeneration of brownfield land. I'd particularly like to actually look at the costs, the benefits of that, because um, this is, I think, an in interest of every constituent authority. Those that have got the brownfield land want rid of it. Um, and for it to be used effectively. And those with green land don't want it built on, they want brownfield sites regenerated. And residents generally want to live where they currently live and don't want to be parceled out to miles away from where they are. And so this is, I think, a real community interest for the whole of the West Midlands. I think spending a bit of time actually getting into the weeds of this and actually saying, what sites have we actually done? What was the benefit? And I'm particularly interested in would these sites really have gone a, not gone ahead if the West Midlands Authority hadn't put the money in? I, I, so I think there's a big piece of work there and I'm not actually sure how we do it, but um, I think there's some important questions because at the end of the day, I want the government to give us more money on this. But that's my yeah, objective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, point well, mate, so leave that with us and we'll look at how and when and where we fit that in, but it is a really... As you say, it's, it's critical because we want, we want enough money within the single settlement deal to enable us to unlock the sites and without the, having that evidence-based work, may not get that. Yeah, every time I walk to this meeting, I look at the buildings around here and think, they're the same as last time. Why are they still not in use? Councillor <laughs> Bateman? I'd just like to uh, support the that, that broad statement. I mean, if the, the, the CA, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, has imposed upon me today its importance in relation to strategy. And without a strategy and looking at the, how the strategy has been working, it kind of leaves a hole. And, uh, I, you know, I agree everybody would like brownfield strategies, but we need to also to understand how each brownfield strategy affects the the, the, the bigger region rather than just as I said maybe in scrutiny in Wolverhampton delivering on Wolverhampton we perhaps need to see how the strategy affects uh, and and certainly with some of the outlying um, uh, um, county areas that, that, that make up our, our board so it's really really quite crucial that we understand how um, the effects of the policies that have been taken um, in the lead up to today have, have, have performed and how we try to um, create the sort of uh, 
opportunities going forward that uses brownfield and strengthens our areas. Um, and, and But I think we need to look at it in a strategic way rather than in an individual side by side sort of, of way. And it's important that the transport does get laid over the top. You know, I was arguing 40 years, but there's a man behind me here who who's nodding his head. We were at daggers drawn for most of the time I, I, I knew him and I bumped into him coming in. I'm really pleased that he's still at hard at it. But the but the issues that we that we did 40 years ago um, are really still having impact or not enough impact um, on the stuff that we do today. I think it'd be really good for us if we if we if we understood that when we do put some housing down or we create a a school that put it at the end of a cul-de-sac and it's still happening today and a, and, a, and a, a, a unit for people to go to in terms of health, where do we find? They're being put in even more, even more ridiculous situations than they ought to be. It's the strategy that really counts. And if we do ourselves a favour in the short period of time we're on here, in the 10 or 15 years of, uh, of the policy, it, will, it would be by creating um, that sort of um, platform in which you know, we can really ana analyze and try to get out um, the, str the strategic importance of, the, of this big issue. Jeff. Thank you, Mike. Councillor Waters, final point. We no longer have the Black Country Plan. However, it's a case of the government still expects, I say it's, a, uh, Michael Gove says it's advisory that we actually build X amount of houses, well, properties in each area. But the advisory is actually, basically, yes, we do need to still do them. And like in in Warsaw, in all these brown holes, we've got a lot of green field and we are trying to focus away from that and actually use brown field. But it's not going to happen on all of it. So it's it's an ongoing thing that we're all actually dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think whilst we have um, a budget that allows us to remediate brown field, uh, it is appropriate that this committee looks at the benefits of that of those projects. Uh, okay, and we just have then the WMCA board forward plan for noting. And then that moves us on to the next meeting, which is Monday the 4th of September. So have a good summer, everyone. You won't be working, you're pleased to know that you're not going to be called back for five meetings through the summer holidays on this time. <laughs> so you can enjoy your summer. So um, I'll see you all in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.